All right. So what did you think? Have you ever seen them create a mandala before? And, you know, the thing that always gets me is that they always destroy them in the end. I'm like weeks of work, you know, creating this work of art and and they destroy them in the end. But it's really a story of life and uh, and uh, destruction and rebirth. And um, they believe that we are too attached to the material. And uh, so to destroy that is to actually learn to let go. And uh, so the first one we watched here was the one with the chanting. And um, that's Tibetan chanting. And when I was with some Tibetan monks and and they started chanting, it was almost as if the vocal vibrations became three-dimensional and they could move them as they wanted throughout different spaces. And uh, that sometimes they were in the center, sometimes they were in like stereo, sometimes they were like coming from all around. So they could really control uh, their voices and their, their chanting. A, a, a similar type of chanting, there's a great uh, movie um, with a guy named uh, Paul Pena, and uh, it's called Genghis Blues, and it's about Tuvan throat singing. And um, so Paul Pena was a blues player, African American, blind, and uh, he got really depressed during one part of his life. And so he would listen to his radio, and it was a shortwave radio. He liked listening to music from all around the world. And the, if you've ever had one, the best way to tune in to long distances is at night. So he was up in the middle of the night, and he was hearing these weird sounds. And he thought, oh, maybe it's, maybe it's just not being tuned in. Uh, but every night it was the same. And eventually he realized that it was singing and it was a uh, Tuvan throat singing. And he practiced it and learned how to do it on his own. And then they made a documentary, he flew to Tuva to compete in their yearly festival and uh, everybody loved him and he was happy again. And, you know, so it's kind of a neat story. So the thing with Tuvan throat singing, it's a type of chanting, uh, but um, rather than manipulating your voice spatially, it actually has both a high note and a low note at the same time. So after watching this movie, you know, I was living alone at the time, so I just walk around my apartment practicing like Tuvan throat singing. Um, so I haven't done it in a while, like I haven't done it in like five years, but I'm going to give it a shot. Okay, so the trick is you're supposed to have a low note and a high note at the same time. So it might take me a few tries. Let's see. <clears throat> So could you hear both the high and the low? They can make better music with it. I can just make the sounds. But uh, all right. See, you weren't expecting that, were you? All right. So as we talk about uh, the book um, and EMDR, go ahead and color your mandalas and see how that is for you. You can pick any one you want. And um, before we begin, The Body Keeps the Score, there are a lot of books on EMDR. Um, but you might as well, if you're going to get one, you might as well get the original one. 
by Francine Shapiro and her colleagues. And she has three different editions out. This is uh, probably the second edition and she made some revisions. So this is the one I chose. And um, it's pretty good if you want the basics of EMDR. Um, I know I shared my story of EMDR with you um, about me kind of being a little traumatized when all these soldiers came on a train in India and you know, held guns in my head and all that. And then years later, a student of mine learned EMDR and uh, came and taught taught my class about EMDR, needed a volunteer, so I volunteered, no students would. And uh, then the next semester, I didn't buy into it, but the next semester I invited her back, teach my class the next semester. And, um, and she asked me, hey, how'd that work for you, Grafton? And I, I hadn't realized it, but those thoughts hadn't recurred in the same, at least every now and then I'd remember it, but not in the same intensity. It was very much like they describe it in the book, that it's no more than a memory, something that happened in the past, but no longer that emotional intensity of a traumatic memory. Uh, so it really did uh, give me peace about about that experience. So then I was sold on it. And uh, the um, so the way I was taught it is different than the way they talk about it in The Body Keeps the Score. So The Body Keeps the Score is pretty straightforward. Um, and uh, most people just use like their pointer finger and they explain to the client to sit in a comfortable position and yet, you know, try to have both feet on the floor, your hands relaxed, uh, sit squarely towards the therapist about three or four feet away. You don't want to invade their space. And, uh, and you don't want them to move their heads back and forth. You only want them to move their eyes back and forth. I also tend to hold my hand a little above their nose. So they're not like looking at the ceiling, but they're looking slightly angled up. Um, and now the book would say, think about uh, a disturbing or traumatic event and follow my fingers and they move it about 14 inches back and forth. And they may do 30 times back and forth. And um, then they would ask the client, where are you at now? How are you doing with this? What are you thinking or feeling? And the interesting thing in the book was that they didn't have to tell you specifics about the trauma they just need to express kind of where they are in that moment and then they say okay let's take notice of where you're at and so it's kind of acknowledging this is where you're at now and then they'll do 30 more repetitions of the eye movement and they'll go through this process and what they notice was that it's almost like stream of consciousness, only it's like stream of memory. And all different kinds of memories, if you kind of open yourself up to it, uh, stream in and out of your consciousness. And there's no real rhyme or reason about what connects them. Sometimes there's a theme, but sometimes not. Sometimes the memories are real. Sometimes it's their imagination reframing the experience and um sometimes the people the clients become extremely emotional and so the therapist checks in with them uh and if it's acceptable they continue on 
with the eye movement. And after about, I would say, 45 minutes, I that's what most sessions are because I like to spend the last 10 minutes processing where they're at, how was it for them, was it helpful at all. Um, I don't want them to leave in a, an emotional state. So I always leave 10 minutes at the end to process things. Um, but the way I was taught it was a little different. And I don't think there's any right or wrong way. I think we're still learning about this. It's fairly new. Um, and uh, so the way I was taught it was a little more um, organized maybe. So, um, so we start off with relaxation and then I have them find basically a safe place in their mind where they feel safe and relaxed. And then we do scaling questions, one through 10, how do they feel? And then we do 30 repetitions of the eye movement, ask them how they feel um, or what they're thinking about. And then we ask them to think about a difficult event or a traumatic event. And then we do the Likert scale and it's usually much higher, eight or nine. And then we do the eye movement and we ask them how they feel and um, do a Likert scaling. And then we go back to relaxation. So the way I was taught, it alternates between the two. Um, but it seems like it works just as well staying with that feeling and moving uh, unconsciously from one memory to another or one thought to another. So I don't think it, I don't know if one works better than the other. Um, and other people incorporate tapping um, or other other means. So I think they're exploring a lot of different ways, trying to figure out which one is the best. I put two or three additional articles on D2L that neither of the books really talked about. Um, so one is about how uh, when we sleep, spinal fluid washes the brain and takes away toxins and it prevents Alzheimer's and Parkinson and some theorize that it may help to, uh, if we have a traumatic event, uh, possibly other chemicals are created that may not be healthy for us. And it also washes our brains with that. It also helps to uh, REM sleep. There's another article on there that talks about how REM and sleep help to reorganize uh, the psychology of our memories that we experience that day. Um, a lot of times if somebody experiences a post-traumatic, well, experiences post-traumatic stress disorder or a traumatic event, they probably don't get much sleep. So their brain is not reprocessing anything uh, after that traumatic event occurs. Um, so some theorize that because of stress and lack of sleep after a crisis, those memories might take a greater hold on us because we don't process them through REM. So um, that's where the group got its name, REM, Rapid Eye Movement. Um, and uh, so one of the first things, it doesn't delve into it a lot, but, um, you know, the, uh, the interesting thing is that um, Francine Shapiro, th this was not like something, oh, I think I'll try this, you know? It, it was really just an experience that she had naturally 
and noticed that she felt better. So she was dealing, she was, whenever she was stressed out, she went for a walk. And when, and she, when she was dealing with some uh, difficult uh, things that had occurred, um, she would, I was told that she would look uh, at hills and trees around her, all the different colored leaves and shadings, and she'd be looking up and her eyes would be moving back and forth as she looked at the natural scenery and she realized that she was feeling calmer. And she kind of made this connection and she's like, oh, she was so anxious that, you know, um, if anything that would help, she's going to try to keep doing to see if it continued to help. And it did. And so she didn't jump to any conclusions, but she started experimenting with it and exploring this more. And uh, over the years, she developed uh, this technique of EMDR. And um, most people like myself uh, didn't really accept it in the beginning, but eventually most of us see it work or experience it ourselves and we're kind of sold on it. So it's like we have to see it work in real life for us to accept it. We're a bit skeptical, um, but it does. And uh, and they still don't know completely why, but they're coming up with a lot more theories about it. I think one of the main things is all of the different stories that he shares in the book. Um, and uh, I think that, um, I think, you know, another thing that, uh, that I might talk about before the end of the class is probably regrets and how we carry regrets with us as well as trauma. And sometimes we're stuck. And uh, we'll talk about how to move through those as well. Um, so the one thing he wrote was, I've been looking for a long time for a way to help people revisit their traumatic past without becoming re-traumatized. And that always seemed to be the issue because every time they were triggered by something or asked to revisit it, it's as if they were re-experiencing the event because they were stuck in that fight or flight mode. But this seems to uh, bring out strong emotions and strong memories, but as the individual experiences it with a combination of the eye movement, it tends to change the type of memory. I would even guess that it changes where the memory is stored or how it's stored or accessed. And um, it activates all of the parts of the brain that were not functioning uh, as well as they did before the trauma. And, uh, and it processes that event into a more cognitive memory rather than a re-experiencing of the emotional event. So, uh, you know, that seems to be uh, the common outcome. One of the one of the things they do share is that it does not work as well with adults who had experienced excessive sexual abuse as a child. Um, but it works well with adults who experience trauma as an adult. So that's who it works best with. But even if it only works 25% with adults who experienced trauma as a child, that I, hey, I'm going to try it anyway for that 25%. It might work because uh, that's more than we have going right now with other methods other than medication. And then as soon as you're off the medication, all the symptomology recurs. So I'd be willing to give it a try and hope my client is in that 25% that it works for. 
Um, the one thing the book did not write about, and I wasn't able to find a statistic on it because I was wondering about it was myself, uh, for myself was, I wonder how well it works with children who have experienced abuse and you, and you try EMDR when they're still children. So uh, I'm going to try to find some answers on that because uh, they really only write about using it with adults. So I'm sure it's sometime since these studies that they've tried it with children. Um, it's hard to get funding for any studies with kids, but I'm sure somebody's tried it. They talk about at the end of the chapter, what is EMDR? Well, that's still one of the biggest questions. Is it a form of exposure therapy? It's not exposure therapy like desensitization. Um, I think it's very different than that, but I think it does expose individuals to the traumatic memory and allows them to reprocess them in a way that they had not before. So in that sense, it's exposure. But when we talk about exposure therapy, um, it's almost kind of like uh, desensitization. And I don't think that's what it is. Uh, might be, I might be wrong. Um, and uh, then they have a little section on exploring the sleep connection. And they, you know, I do think there is a, a connection with that. And, um, you know, rather than experiencing REM while we're asleep and processing things that we've experienced during the day while we're awake, we're we're almost doing REM while we're awake. So, you know, uh, they have done brain scans before and after, but they don't know how this affects the brain why you know what the causation is what's the impact of emdr they know what the results are because they can see a difference in brain functioning both before and after but they really don't know what happens during the process that creates the difference so i think it's a great thing um and uh so Next week, our chapters about yoga. Uh, I asked my wife if she'd lead a, a yoga class, but she can't come here because we got four little kids. But have any has, have any of you ever led a yoga class? I've never led one, but I've been to them. <laughs> You've been to them? Well, that's good. Yeah, I like you, doing the yoga classes. Alexi has. Do you want to lead a yoga class? Read the chapter on yoga and lead a yoga class just for like 15 minutes, not for like a long one, just because that's what the chapter is about. All right. And we'll get we'll get in a circle and people at home can try it at home. So that'll be good. All right. So that'll be one of our exercises next week. All right. Has anybody had any experience with EMDR? Um, yesterday, I at the counseling at my practicum counseling site, I got to see the first time, um, firsthand with one of the therapists there. How did but they she, do it? She did these little electronic things that the girl sat and held each hand, and she shut her eyes, and then she read a script to her. What did the electronic things do? She was so what it did was it would flip from one side to the other with a little like beep or so, not a beep. And then the girl was supposed to put her eyes this way and then that way, this way, then that way. So, so it's um, kind of a combination between tapping and eye movement. Yeah, I think so. But huh. um, so I, 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 it was very interesting. And then she told a story about what kind of animal she wanted to be and, hmm. um, and then, but, but the girl seemed visibly different. So when she sat down first, she was real pale because she has anxiety problems. And then after that, it, it's like her face 
glowed and it had like a pink color to it which was i thought we, was interesting i mean i observed it i don't know if anybody else did. more relaxed yes yes emotionally not so stressed good yes so that was a good experience yeah all right um so what we're going to do now is our our experiential exercises. We have three uh, sound recordings. They're from YouTube, so there might be an ad beforehand, but um, we're not going to watch them. We're just going to listen to them, okay? And you have a choice. You can either um, write automatically, like whatever comes to your mind, uh, for the time that you're listening to that segment, or you can draw while you're listening to those sounds. But it's you have to allow your mind to kind of wonder and be open and just see where it takes you. Don't guide your thoughts. Just allow whatever happens to come into your mind. And uh, so we're going to do three of them. So you're going to have, a, you know, you could have a mix of writing, a picture, writing. You can mix it up, but just stick with one thing per soundscape. So you're going to have three different things. And then our discussion board is pretty easy this week. Um, you're just going to describe your responses to kind of the mandala and the three soundscapes and whether you draw or wrote and share something you're comfortable sharing. Uh, so it's a pretty easy discussion board this week. You'll have it done by the end of class. All right, so the first one is the sound of a babbling brook in, in springtime. What if before you ever Not hammered in a nail, drove in a screw, or cut a hole, you... All right, so we're going to listen to this for 10 minutes or until it stops. I can't hear it. Uh, maybe I forgot to... Share the sound when I shared my screen like this. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.
grind, so we're gonna be. This next one, and you can switch. You can stay stay with writing or stay with drawing or switch to the other one, whatever whatever you want to do. Now, this one is called Sounds of Autumn, Autumn Forest. Red light therapy is a very specific form of light that when it penetrates...
All right, we're going to do our last one. This one has that Native American flute to it, so I thought I'd add some kind of little music. And it's rain. It's called a rain flute, so there's rain in the background. Hi, Mark Barden at Sandy Hook Promise here. When the gunman shot his way in,
So post what you feel like sharing. You don't you're not forced to post anything you don't want to, but try to find something you feel like sharing with us in your discussion board. Talk about things we've done tonight or mandalas or EMDR or what you uh, did while you were drawing or writing. And uh, that's the class. Hey, nice. Excellent. All right. We'll see you next week.